One of the most important things in a Kubernetes cluster is storage. Most applications you deploy to your cluster are going to need some kind of persistent storage. So you need a way to easily and automatically provision storage with persistent volume claims. A good solution should enable us to do all of this, but should be reliable, highly available, and above all, it should be easy to use. Self-storage is a well-known storage solution that has been around for years now, and it provides all such features and more. And the great news is that we can set up self-storage directly in our Kubernetes cluster using Rook. I provision storage for all of my home lab Kates clusters with Rookself, and today I'm going to show you how you can do the same in your own Kates clusters. Once set up, you'll be able to easily provision block storage, file system storage, and object storage for all of your cloud native applications. Hi, my name is Morris, and I am happy you joined me again for another Kubernetes tutorial. I am glad that there are many of you out there who are interested in this kind of content, so please consider subscribing for more. At the outset, I mentioned that the key to setting up Ceph in Kubernetes is Rook. Rook is an open source cloud native orchestrator. It provides the platform, framework, and support for self-storage to natively integrate with cloud-native environments. If you head over to rook.io, you'll find much more information as well as a quick start guide to help you set up self-storage in your cluster. For a deep dive into Ceph's architecture, you can also check out docs.ceph.com and there you can learn about all the different Ceph components and how they work together to run the storage cluster. Note that it is not necessary for you to know all of this in order to get started with RookSelf. However, the more you use the storage cluster, it might be helpful to be aware of some of the concepts, especially when troubleshooting capacity issues or if you wish to modify your cluster down the line by adding or removing storage. So what are the things that you need to have in your cluster in order to get started? Basically, you will need to add disks to your k cluster nodes that are unpartitioned and contain no file systems. In some cases, LVM might be required, so make sure you have the LVM package installed on all nodes in your cluster. I have added an extra 40 gig disk to each of the VMs in my 5 node Kubernetes cluster. I have simply added the extra disks via the web console of my Proxmox server, which is the virtualization software I use in my home lab. You can also follow the procedure to do the same in whichever virtualization software you are using. Just be sure to only add the disks and avoid doing any extra partitioning or formatting tasks. So at this point, we are ready to install Rook. After you clone the Rook Git repository, you will find all the manifest files we use under the Rook deploy examples directory. The first thing we do now is install the custom resource definitions and the Rook operator using kubectl create. The Rook operator will be responsible for managing the self cluster and keeping all the components running smoothly. Make sure that the Rook operator is in a running state by executing a kubectl get pods in the Rook self namespace before moving on to the next step. Once the operator is running, we can now create the self cluster. Different cluster definitions are provided for different use cases, including test environments like Minikube or for Kubernetes clusters running in the cloud. In our case, we'll use the cluster.yaml manifest, which contains cluster settings for a production cluster running on bare metal. Applying this manifest with kubectl create, we'll go ahead and create a brand new self cluster in our Kubernetes cluster. During this process, Rook will detect and consume the new disks we added to each of the nodes and will create OSDs or object storage devices for each of the disks. Now, if you want to dig deep into how OSDs work, you can see the self architecture documentation. We can verify that the cluster is running by listing the pods in the Rook self namespace. Please note that this process might take a while to finish, so make sure that all the activity as regards new pods or jobs being created in the Rook self namespace has completed fully. Once all the Rook self components are up and running, we can install Rook self tools by applying the toolbox manifest. This will create a Rook self tools pod that is used to administer the self cluster. We can exec into this pod and run self status, which shows a healthy self cluster. We can also run the self OSD status command, which shows status, capacity, and usage information for each individual OSD. Rookself also has a web-based dashboard, which displays similar information. If you execute kubectl get secrets in the Rookself namespace, you will see the Rookself dashboard password secret, 
which contains the admin password for the web UI. You can retrieve the default password by running this command. You can also run a kubectl get services to show which service is being used by the dashboard. And then you should be able to access the web UI by port forwarding to the service. Once logged into the dashboard, we can see all the storage cluster statistics displayed in a beautiful UI. So now that we have a running healthy cluster, there's one other thing we need to do before we can start creating and consuming storage. And that is we need to have storage classes defined which will enable us to dynamically provision storage volumes for different types on demand. You can also see that if I run the kubectl get storage class that I don't yet have any storage classes defined in my cluster. So let us go ahead and create these storage classes now. Now there are three types of storage classes that we can provision using Ceph and that is block storage which simulates mounting a block device, file system storage, which can be mounted on multiple pods, and object storage, which is similar to AWS S3 storage. To create a storage class of block storage, you use the storage class.yaml manifest in the deploy slash example slash CSI slash RBD directory. This manifest will create a replica pool from which it will provision block storage. You can see that the replicated size of this pool is 3, meaning all storage will be replicated across 3 nodes in your cluster. This is how Ceph achieves redundancy, so you do not have to worry about some of your PVCs being lost in case one of your nodes is down. This means that your total storage is effectively divided by 3. So in my case where I have 5 40 gig disks totaling 200 gigs, my actual cluster capacity will be a third of that which is slightly above 60 gigs. So that is an important thing for you to keep in mind when adding disks to your nodes. So all we have to do now is apply the manifest with kubectl create and check to see that the new storage class is now available in the cluster. And sure enough we have the rookself block storage class up and ready to use by our deployments. A MySQL stateful set and a WordPress deployment manifest is included in the examples directory so you can go ahead and apply it to test the new storage class. If you take a look at the persistent volume claim definition within the manifest you can see the storage class name set to rookself block. After deploying either of these examples you can verify that the pods are running and that the PVCs have been created successfully. And here we can see that the new PVC with the rookself block storage class has been created and successfully bound to the pod. To create the file system storage class, we will apply two manifests. First, the file system YAML in the examples directory, which creates a new file system called myfs that also has a replicated size of 3. The second manifest is the storage class.yaml manifest in the deploy slash example slash CSI slash CephFS directory. This manifest contains the definition and default settings of the rookself storage class. After applying both these manifests with kubectl create, we can verify that the rookcephfs storage class has been added to the cluster. To test out the new file system storage, we have the cube registry YAML manifest in the same directory, which will create a PVC and spin up a deployment to consume this storage. If you take a look at the persistent volume claim definition within the manifest, you can see the storage class name set to rook cephfs. We can go ahead and apply this manifest with kubectl create and verify that the application successfully deployed with kubectl get pods and kubectl get pvc. We now have a successful deployment with a file system pvc created and bound. We can also see the storage class of rookcephfs signifying the storage type of the pvc. Finally, let us create the object storage class. First, we need to create a self object store. The object.yaml manifest creates the object store called mystore with a replicated size of 3. It also creates a storage gateway accessible on port 80 which we will use to access the object store. After running kubectl create on the object.yaml, we can verify that the object store has been created by checking to see that our RGW pod is running in the rookself namespace. Once that is validated, we can now create the rookself bucket storage class by applying the storage class bucket delete yaml manifest. The delete keyword defines the retention policy which will delete the data when a bucket is deleted.
You can use the storage class bucket retain YAML manifest if you'd like the bucket data to be retained after buckets have been deleted. If we run a kubectl get storage class, now we can see that the rookself bucket storage class is also active in the cluster. So now at this point, we should be able to create a bucket and store files to it. To demonstrate how you can do this, I'm going to use the min.io client, which is a command line tool that can manage Amazon's S3 compatible file systems. I will link the min.io client git project, including the instructions for all the steps taken in this video in the description below. So you can also set up this easily in your own environment. I myself am running Mac, so I installed the min.io client using brew. And once installed, you should be able to type the mc command in your terminal to check that it is installed correctly. So now we can create a bucket by applying the object bucket claim delete.yaml manifest. This particular manifest defines an object bucket claim which creates a bucket using the rookself bucket storage class. After we apply the manifest with kubectl create, we can run kubectl get object bucket claim, which shows the self delete bucket claim created. Connection details and credentials for this bucket are also generated and stored in a self delete bucket config map and secret. Let us extract these details and store them in environment variables, which we will use to connect to the bucket in a bit. These commands are also included in the Rook documentation. Now, we need to make sure that we can connect to the object storage gateway. To do this, we can do a port forward to the RGW MyStore service in the Rook safe namespace, so the gateway will be accessible via localhost. You can connect to the gateway as well using external IPs or domain names if you have a load balancer and ingress controller running in your cluster. You can check out my other video linked up here which shows how you can install Metal LB load balancer and Nginx ingress in your Kubernetes cluster. So now you should be able to connect to the bucket using the mc command. First you need to create an alias for the connection with the mc alias set followed by the name of the alias, the host, the AWS access key ID, and the AWS secret access key. Make sure to include the port number in the host. And once the connection alias is successfully set, you can run the mcls alias name slash bucket name to list the contents of the bucket. You can now store files to the bucket using the mccp command. There's a whole host of file actions you can perform with the MC command, including downloading, deleting, moving, and much more. Of course, any other application that requires S3 storage can also connect to the self object storage. So by now, you should be able to address most, if not all, the storage requirements in your Kubernetes cluster using Rook and Self. Once again, thanks a lot for watching. And if you found any value in this video, leave a like and please consider subscribing for more Kubernetes tutorials. I will see you in the next one.